Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, Friday morning, uh, July the 8th. I'm glad to be here. This is one child abuse survivor to another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. Chat room is open, and I did pop the link in there to what we're, we're talking about. And we've been on this for a few months now, looking at Robert Bernie's web pages, uh, www.joy2, the number 2, meu.com. And um, we're looking at the grief process, and that's what I'm um, interested in as part of the inner child uh, work that he's got here, inner child uh, healing. So that's what we're looking at. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've got over 33,000 shows to listen to. I know a lot of people are tuning in and, you know, to hear what I have to say and, and, and to, to be part of my healing journey. And I really appreciate it, you know. I just hopefully it's helping somebody out there to feel, to, to understand, you know, that that there's, they're not alone and there is help out there and there there are good people out there and and, and life can be good if we if we choose the right <clears throat> right path for ourselves and we and we get ourselves the help that we need and we make sure you know whatever it is whether it's you know group support or or counseling or therapy or or just talking to somebody or or self help whatever it is but just to allow ourselves to have a good life you know so I I, I appreciate everybody who's taking the time to tune in. And I'm not a counselor or a therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows. And I just wanted to be one more voice, really speaking out against child abuse and uh, talking about the issues that surround child abuse because it's always, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my I just woke up so my voice is not really good, that not that good yet. But, um, yeah, the the issues of child abuse, you know, it's always been minimized, minimized, minimized. I mean, people, people because it's an uncomfortable topic, right? It's an uncomfortable issue. You know, nobody wants to think about it. It's discouraging, it's disgusting, and it's horrible. And the people that have to, have had to survive it, of course, you know, so many times it's hard for them to talk about it. But but myself, you know, I don't mind talking about it because, and I don't minimize it. I just tell it like it is because it's the truth and the reality of what it is. And if I, if I don't, if we don't get to the truth and the reality of what it is, then we're never going to be able to fix it. And that's what's going on with my healing journey. I mean, I have to get to the truth and reality of what happened to me as a child. And, I have to to be able to change the way that I feel in order for myself to feel healthy and whole and move on, you know. So, and and to embrace all the parts of myself. So that's what I'm learning how to do. And so I'm not a counselor or therapist, and you have to listen at your own discretion because I'm talking about abuse and it's a sensitive subject. So you have to know what's good for you to listen to. And you know, if you're a survivor, these types, this type of information of, of any any type like this could trigger you, all right? So you have to know what's good for you to listen to. And if, if you think the show may bother you, you have to turn it off. It's your discretion, right? And young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission to listen to my shows. I say this on every show because it's really important to me. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. And, you know, we're trying to protect children and save children's lives, right? So if you're under 18, you know, you have somebody who's an adult who can, uh, even if you don't have a parent who cares, I know I was there, um, if you have somebody in your life, hopefully an adult somewhere, a teacher, coach, mentor, someone that you know who's an adult who can help you make a decision whether you should be listening to my shows, right? I really appreciate that. So we'll get right into this uh, grief grief information here from Robert <clears throat> Robert Bernie, and he's Robert Bernie is he's a codependence therapist. He's a grief counselor. He's a, a an author. He's written a book, Codependence: The Dance of Wounded Souls. And he's also um, a spiritual teacher, and so he's a survivor. So he's written a whole lot of stuff here. And if you go to the site index, you can see, like, the different categories of his work. It's all there. Right now we're working on inner child healing, and so part of it is the grief process, right, grieving. And, at, and we're about half, not even halfway through the page here from www.joy to, to me and you. So that's www.joy, J-O-Y, to the number two, M-E-U dot com. And this is called grief process techniques. And Robert Bernie was talking about this whole issue of, of the grief process. And you know, he says, um, you know, he's we were about a quarter of the way down the page. And he says, in order to do inner child work, we need to be will- willing to do the grief work. And he says, emotions are energy, and that energy needs to be released through crying and raging. We need to own our own our feelings about what happened to us. And he says, we need to own our right to be angry that our needs were not met. And this is sort of where we where we left off here. So in order to do the inner child work, we need to be willing to do the grief work. And grieving, I, mean, I was talking about that yesterday. I mean, I've done a lot of grieving. And I'm sure a lot of people have. We all grieving something, you know. But I don't know if I've necessarily grieved the stuff that I need to grieve, um, you know, in order to help my inner child, you know, my, my inner self, who I was so long ago, uh, through all the different parts of my life where... 
you know, so many horrible things happen to me. And, <clears throat> you know, th this is the thing. I mean, I'm, I've been grieving forever, but have I really been grieving what I need to grieve? And so that's kind of interesting. I, I, I want to do a whole lot more study into this because I think that I do need to do that. If, um, at certain periods of my life, I, I, I would spend, you know, even a year grieving or, or crying or whatever, going to work and then, you know, at night coming home and just having a meltdown. And um, so I have done a lot of grieving, but um, and it was good to be able to do that, to get those feelings out and to be able to release that stuff. But I don't know if I, I'm sure I still have a lot of grieving to do, and especially about what happened to me in sp specifically, because mainly I was grieving for my mother because I was grieving that, you know, when she passed away when I was, I was uh, 30 and I was just turning 31, and I believe, no, I was just turning 30, <clears throat> and she. I grieved that whole year, so by the time I was done there, I was about 31. And so I, I was grieving mainly for, for the fact that I was never going to be able to get what I needed from her, from as a baby, as an you know an infant, as a as a, a toddler, you know, as a as a four or five-year-old, you know, then a, a young child, you know, and then as an older child and then a teenager. I was never going to get what I needed from her. She was never going to be able to go back and undo all that stuff. And I, it was just a harsh reality for me that that, that was going to be that was our relationship and it was never ever going to be reconciled on this planet. So <clears throat> I knew it wasn't anyway because I mean I knew my mother, you know, before right, you know, up until she died had never ever taken responsibility for what she had done to me or to anyone in my family, right? So you know what my dad didn't either, so there you go, but my mother wasn't going to either. The two of them did not take responsibility. I mean, even though they were brought up on abuse charges and they were busted cold turkey. So you know, they just didn't want to take responsibility for it, and they thought they should be allowed to treat their children this way. And they felt perfectly exonerated, and and they felt perfectly justified in what they did to their children, right? And that just used to make me so angry because I was like, how can you, how can you feel this way? You know what I mean? My mother used to cry the blues because she was abused, right? She'd be like, I was abused as a child. My mother beat me with a horse whip, and I took all the beatings for the kids. And this is the stuff she would tell me, you know. And she would be grieving for her lost childhood. And then, of course, she would turn around and beat the shit out of me and, and think that was okay, right? It's like, well, you're a bad kid. That's what you deserve. You know, you're just rotten and evil and you should have died. And, you know, she could justify that. But that's because I was just her punching bag, you know. <clears throat> she was just using me to take all of her aggression, her anger out on, you know what I mean? And it, she she could justify it. So, I mean, there's there's something really twisted right there. But, you know, this is the whole thing. I mean, I was grieving that whole relationship with my mother for like a year and, and I've been grieving for my brothers forever. Um, my brothers, you know, when I was growing up, when I was a little tiny kid, uh, were probably the only positive thing in my life. Uh, even though they were drug users and they were in and out of prison, some of them, um, there was three brothers living in a home when I was little. And they were a sort of a sense of joy for me growing up in that home because my parents were not, My par that's when the social workers were coming around because my parents were brought up on charges. And my brothers were actually trying to uh, they were older than me, and they were trying to, um, I guess, create some sort of normalcy for me. So they would play with me a little bit. They would, oh, they would torture my Barbies and stuff every now and then. But I mean, you know, that's what young, young boys will do. Um, they would uh, try to make me feel better. They would say stuff like, "Oh, you're you're a good girl. You're a cute girl. Do what my dad says, so they don't get mad at you." And they would try to. Like my, one of my brothers, especially my brother Chess, would try to would actually intervene on my behalf if my dad was hitting me with a belt or whatever, and he would get my dad to stop if he was in the house, right? And so, you know, I was grieving for the loss of my brother uh, Chess because he was killed and murdered when I was seven years old, just turning eight. Um, and I was grieving for for all kinds of stuff, you know, and my, the loss of my brother's lives later as they killed themselves, the, my, the next two, Rob and Howard, and. The loss of the relationship I had with my brother Kevin, which I never had because he moved out before I was born. Actually, right when I was born. He was 16 years older than me, and he moved out right when I was born. And, um, you know, he didn't move back into the house ever again, and he moved away, really far away. So I didn't get to know him, and um, so I was always grieving that. But I was never, I don't think I really grieved my own stuff, you know, that I needed to be able to grieve. Because like I was saying probably a couple of shows ago, we weren't allowed to feel anything about what was happening to us, you know. We weren't allowed to show any ex emotions or, or express how we were feeling about the, the garbage that was going on in the home and the, the crisis and the, 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 the problems. And, you know, we weren't allowed to, to express anything. We just had to sit there with a smile on our face because our parents were like, you know, we're not listening to anything from you guys and you better have a smile on your face, you know. So 
it, it was harsh, you know what I mean? Like, their treatment was of us was pretty harsh, and I don't think I really ever grieved anything for myself. I, I used to feel a little bit sorry for myself when I was young, especially when I was probably around, I don't know, 15 when my friend got killed. I was actually really feeling sorry for myself then because I, I was cursing God and, you know, telling him, how could, you know, how could he leave me here, you know? Like, my friend had been killed and my best friend, who was the only really positive thing in my life except for, you know, a couple of other friends that I had. And so I've done grief work, but I don't know if I've actually grieved what I need to grieve for myself, for my inner child, right? And I've done a little bit of it, but I want to want to learn how to do the rest of it so I can get over this stuff, right? So he says, we need to own our right to be angry that our needs were not met. You know, and that's that's important, right? I mean, as abused children, your needs are not met, you know what I mean? Um, even if you weren't abused, you may have not had your needs met. Right, I mean, so many times children just don't get their their emotional needs met, their the physical needs met, the their their psychological needs met, you know, the whole emotional psychological stuff, or or you know anything from their parents. They just don't get this stuff met. May not even be you know being really abused, just kind of neglected, and um, it's pretty harsh. But that happens to all kinds of people. And you know, we I, I guess he's saying Robert Burns says we need to own our right. So we need to say it's okay that I'm angry that this happened to me. I, I own the right to be mad that my parents did what they did to me. And that's that's what happened to me uh, last, when I wrote that the blog, Not So Fond Memories Growing Up in an Abusive Home. My dad was living with me. <laughs> I let him come and move in with me for a year because he was elderly. He's 87 years old at the time. And, and he wanted to move to Canada. He was living in the States. And he was like, he, there was nobody down there that was going to be able to help look after him as he was getting older and older. He's 87 years old, right? He was kind of, you know, not doing so well. And he said... Can I move up there with you? You know, so none of my siblings, my my two siblings that are left here, they wouldn't take him in. They said no, way. you know, like absolutely not. My brother said no way, he's not staying with me. Uh, my sister said no, nope, not staying with me. And so I said, well, Dad, I said the only person that's left is me. So if you want to come and stay with me, you can. Now this is my abuser dad, you know, from from so long ago, right? This is the same man, right, who totally trashed his his wife and his children and totally made a huge mess of his family and took no responsibility for it and thought he was a saint. He thought he was God himself, really. Um, well, maybe not God, but he thought he was God's messenger. You know, he was a very sick and twisted person. But anyway, so, you know, this man, this is a man that threatened my life, you know, as a child. Like, literally tried to drive me and my sister over a cliff. Um, I was afraid that he would kill us at night because he he said he would kill us at night. You know, like he would he would threaten to kill the whole family at night um, quite often. So we you know we were always kind of a little leery. He was always trying to commit suicide when I was little. Um, you know, he was he was not doing well. He was brought up on charges, abuse charges. Both my parents were. You know, like this was an unstable man. You know, what I, mean? I mean, my parents were completely unstable. So, you know, out of the goodness of my heart, I thought, okay. You know, maybe we can reconcile this this horrible relationship that we've always had. You know, and maybe you know by him staying with me for a year, we can get some of this stuff that that you know we didn't get when when I was growing up. Build our relationship. I don't know what was going through my mind, but anyway, it was obviously the wrong move because my dad came here and was staying with me and, and created all kinds of problems for me. The same garbage that he was doing to me before. Uh, just no respect, you know, no respect for me, for my boundaries, for my privacy, you know, walking in on me in the bath in the bathroom. Still, a 41-year-old woman, and he's still ogling me. I was like, you know, nothing's changed, right? <laughs> Nothing has changed. He held a knife out at me in my kitchen, you know, um, saying, well, I could still kill you. I could take you on. You know, he he was still very, very sick and twisted. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. Nothing's changed, you know what I mean? Like, oh, my God. So... I told him he could stay with me for the year. So I said, in July, you were gone, the next July, right? But I, in October, I started writing my blog, uh, Not So Fond Memories Growing Up in an Abusive Home. And um, that was October of 2009. And so that was just right before I started doing these blog talk shows. And so my dad was here, like, the whole time. And so, you know, I was feeling like I have the right, you know, like the, that's why I'm kind of relating this to this, you know, you need to own the right to be angry that our, that our needs are not met, right? We need to be able to do that. Own the right that our needs were not met. Well, I mean, I was just owning the right that I had a right to be angry, you know, that I had a, a right to be angry about what happened to me and what my parents did to me. And I started writing that blog, Not So Fond Memories Growing Up in an Abusive Home, and I didn't care whether he was here in the apartment or not. Then I started doing Blog Talk Radio in November 2009, which was a month later, 
because I needed to tell the world what happened to me. I was like, oh, my God, what, and what happened to my family? I thought, you know, here's my dad staying with me. Everybody thinks he's a saint, you know, and my inner child was screaming out, going, you're not going to let him hurt us again. You're not going to do that. You know what I mean? Like, you've got to do something. You've got to, for us, for me, you know what I mean, for, for, for who we were so long ago. So here's my inner child just screaming because my abuser dad is living with us, uh, still being as abusive as he ever was, except for he couldn't beat me up. What's he going to do? You know what I mean? Like, about the only thing he couldn't do was beat me up. But I was afraid he would get get one of his uh, psychosis, you know, episodes going again and kill me because that was always an issue when we were growing up. So I didn't sleep well the whole year that he was here. But anyway, you know, it's pretty harsh. I, I thought, no, I have to get this. I have to. I own the right to tell the truth about what happened. So when I started... Uh, writing my blog. That, that's exactly what that was about. It was taking ownership of the tr- of the fact that I needed the truth to get out, and I wanted people to see this man for who he really was. And I really was more interested in in letting the world what, know what happened to our family, not just to me. I mean, I didn't just write a blog about myself, you know. Like I wanted people to know what happened to my family because it was was all wrong. It was all wrong, and I thought, oh my God, you know, I am angry about this. You bet I am. And so I, I started doing Blog Talk Radio, and there you go, the rest is history. But anyway, he moved out like the next July, right on time, because I told him, you're only here for one year, and that's it. So I gave him the year, and you know when he moved out, it was such a relief. That was July 2010. And I published my book just right before that, so my book had come out, Life of Death Redemption, which was the blog, just turned into the book. And uh, my, finally, I felt, you know, some sort of peace. I was like, thank God, because, you know, I need people, like, I want people to know what happened to my family and what ha- what these two abusive people did to me and to my siblings and to each other i mean and the world if i if i don't speak out nobody's going to know because everybody thinks my dad's a saint he walks around oh i just loved my wife and you know I, i'm just i'm just a messenger and a follower of god and whatever he says about himself you know because he's he's very religious spiritual i wouldn't say he's spiritual i don't think he understands the term of the word but he's religious anyway and you know, he has all kinds of people believing that he's this good guy, you know. And I'm thinking, they have no idea what he did to his wife. These people have no clue what he did to to me, to my siblings, right? Oh, my God, you know. So I thought, okay, no, no. I'm not going to my grave with this because I know my sister will not speak out. She will never say anything. My brother, he's just done with it. He's in his 60s. He's ready to, he just, I think he's just waiting to die. My, my older brother, the one, the only one that's left. I think he's just waiting to, to die, really. That seems to be what he's doing, because he's not doing anything. and He's just getting sicker by the year, and, you know, he's in his 60s, and he feels like probably life is over for him, because he's he's never come to terms with what happened to him as a, as a young person. He was he moved out when he was 16, and he tried to save my brothers, and he couldn't save them. He couldn't save them in the home. He couldn't save them on the street. You know, he couldn't save them if he was living in the home, being abused by my dad, my mother, too. Um, he couldn't save them. You know, when we were when he when they were on the streets, living on the streets, uh, two of my brothers. So he tried to save their lives many times, and so I think he's just jaded, and he's just you know he's never really come to terms or peace. You know, he kind of peace with this. So he, and he doesn't want to face it. So he's just one of these people that wants to sit back and just just ignore it. So what it does is eats him alive every day, probably. You know what I mean? He said he wanted to kill my dad when when my mom passed away um, what, 16 years ago now, 15 years ago. Um, my brother didn't go to the funeral, and he and I said, well, you know, I said, you know, yeah, that's cool. If you don't want to go, you don't have to go. You know what I mean? And he said, no, I'll kill him. I'll, I'll kill him if I go to the funeral and I see her, and I see Dad. I'll kill him for sure. Like I can't go, right? Because he had so much, you know, animosity and anger towards my dad. Because my dad threw this huge funeral for my mother, but he would never ever buy her a dress. He would never buy her clothes of any kind my mother like he withheld everything from my mother and and what he abused her horrifically the whole marriage and my brother was like and here he's going to spend you know like fifteen thousand or twenty thousand on a, on a on a funeral for her and he's going to tell these people that he loved his wife oh my god so he was like no no I'll, I'll kill him so i can't go and so yeah that's the situation for my brother between my brother and my dad but the thing is is like you know absolutely horrific we need to be able to own the the, the, the right you know, to say, you know, what what happened to me was wrong. So many times survivors, you know, because we were not allowed to show any feelings or emotions about, you know, how we were being treated, how we were being treated as children, you know, by anyone, whether, whoever the abuser was, even if it wasn't our parents, it could have been somebody else, right? We need to own the, the right to be able to express that, you know. And so many times we don't. We always say, oh, well, we're tough. We can take it. Oh, it's okay. I survived, you know. 
I'm fine, right? You know, having to because that's what we had to do as children to get through the day, <laughs> to get to the next day, right? Would be to say, no, no, I'm rolling with the punches. I'm fine. Whatever it was, whatever it was, you know what I mean. Whatever type of abuse it was, it's the same. It's the same issue of having to go, you know, and carry on. And so a lot of times we just stuff that stuff down there, and we don't allow ourselves to to feel it, you know, and to, to express it and to say, no, what happened to me was wrong, you know. And I and, and I have the right to be angry about it, <laughs> but the whole thing is, is we have to learn how to channel that anger because I, I was angry about it for years and was self injuring, self sabotaging, wanting to kill myself. So see, there you go. Um, anger channeled improperly is distortion. It's distorted, and it's dangerous to yourself and to other people. And so I think that anger, it's not okay to just go off and get all crazy angry. You could hurt yourself and you could hurt somebody else, right? So I did a whole lot of work on anger management and um, all that good stuff. And that really was helpful for me to see, you know, the, the information on that. You know, because I it has all this stuff has helped out immensely. But, um, you know, that's just it. I, that we have to be able to channel that anger properly. So I think there's some stuff here that Robert Burton's talking about here later. He says, grief is energy that needs to be released. And we need to give ourselves permission to feel our pain uh, sadness and rage. We need to own and honor the feelings. We, so he says we need to give ourselves permission, our own self. We need to say, okay, I give myself permission to feel my own pain, right? My own sadness, my own rage. And he says we need to own and honor the feelings. So that's interesting. I'm still kind of working on that. I guess part of grief work is simply owning the sadness and the anger. So he says we need to own the grief about what happened to us as children. And then we also need to own the grief over what effect it has had us as an adult. And, um, yeah, that's just it, you know. Like, I totally, that's what I was sitting around doing when I was writing my blog, you know, Not So Fond Memories Growing Up in an Abusive Home. I mean, it, it, you know, writing about what it, what it did to me, you know what I mean? And, and this show, you know, One Child to Be a Survivor to Another, talking about this stuff is exact, really exactly what I've been doing, which is talking about the effect that it has had on me, you know what I mean, and what, what's happened to my it, to my adult life because of the abuse I suffered, Right. And, I mean, I can't get too graphic on here. <clears throat> I don't know how young the people are who are listening to my shows, you know what I mean? So, I, I mean, as much as I say, okay, I'm, I'm not minimizing anything and I'm not, um, you know, definitely not minimizing anything. Uh, just talking, like, telling it like it is. But then again, I don't know how young the people are who are listening, so certain things I can't get into. There's certain topics that, especially the child sexual abuse that I suffered, I can't even really talk about that because, you know, it's too it's too graphic. It's much too graphic. So there's lots of stuff that you know I'm still working through on my own that you you know the listener the listener who you you know you guys who are here listening to me every day don't realize you know that there's all kinds of stuff I'm doing behind the scenes that I can't do on the air because it's too too graphic you know what I mean um, I have no idea who's if a ten year old or or a, or a twelve year old or fourteen year old or whatever is going to tune in and listen to my show you know what I mean and I can't you know there's certain things that I just don't feel it are right to be, you know, shouting out on the air. It's unfortunate because I'd like to be able to do that. If I knew it was just an adult audience, then I could go through it and, and talk about this other stuff that's been going on with me with the child sexual abuse suffered. And this last six months I've been working on this, right? So I, I've, I'm actually putting it into a book. So that's what I'm doing. So hopefully, you know, people will grab a copy of that book when it comes out. But, yeah, this is, uh, you know, it's pretty harsh. You know, we, we need to have, we need to be able to have the right, to feel angry about what happened to us. And I can talk about that, you know. I mean, I have the right to feel angry that my body was was violated, you know what I mean, by my mother. My mother violated my body by beating me and hurting me and kicking me around and just trashing me, burning me, you know. I look at the scar every day from that burn on my on my side and I you know, it pisses me off because I know that she just she 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 put the cookie sheets down and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, daughter. I'm sorry I burned you." Let's see if we can, you know, get something on that. So, you know, because it hurt. And I was crying and everything. Of course, well, you know, she she got mad and took me into the living room and beat me, slapped me around, you know, grabbed my hair, throw me to the ground, you know, just just trashed me because she burned me. Right? I'm like, oh, thanks. You know, what I mean, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I was so used to being treated like that. That was just par for the course, right? So, you know. I, I have the right to be angry that, that my mother did that to me. I, you know, to, I, so what I need to do, I guess, is for this grief work is is to go through and grieve each, each thing and literally take the time to grieve it. You know what I mean? 
And that would take me a long time because there's all, obviously everybody that knows my story knows there's been a whole lot of garbage done to me as a child. So I need to be able to go through, I guess, and spend some time um, and allow myself to say, I have the right to be angry about that and I'm, and I have the right to be angry that this happened and that, you know, and this, that that happened and name it and claim it and say, that's my right to be angry about that. It's my right. I own that right. It's my right outright to own the feelings. You know what I mean? Those are my feelings and I have every right to be able to feel them and express them. And then I guess we, you know, as what he's saying here is, is just being able to deal, you know, with these, with this stuff that we've, that's happened to us. We have to be able to own all of it. So we have to be able to own the sadness and the anger, right? And so there is some anger stuff, I guess, involved in this, right? Being angry about it. But of course I was angry about it, but I wanted to kill myself, see? So that's a, that's where we have to be really careful um, how we handle the anger portion of it. But he has some suggestions down here. I was just kind of looking at this. He says, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. He's, actually, he's talking about um, things that we can do, like pounding a pillow or things like this. That's things that we can do that would allow us to get some of that anger out, some of the rage out, pounding a pillow or whatever, and, and yelling and shouting, you know, this type of thing. And that was something that I guess people used to do uh, in the 80s. I heard that from... Um, uh, um, there's been a few people that have been talking about that type of therapy, and I can't remember what it's called. But uh, it's it's anger work, you know. It's working through the the, the rage and the anger. But he says <clears throat> it is when we start understanding the cause and effect relationship between what happened to the child that that we were and the effect it had on the adult we became that we can truly start to forgive ourselves. So that's kind of interesting. So he says it. It is when we un- start to understanding the cause and effect relationship between what happened to the child that we were and the effect it had on a, on the adult we became that we can truly start to forgive ourselves. So it's, he says it is only when we start understanding on an emotional level, on a gut level, that we were powerless to do anything any differently that than we did, that we tru- can truly start to love ourselves. <clears throat> okay, so I guess what he's saying is that, you know, by forgiving ourselves, I guess for for not for not being able to save ourselves, right? There was no way we could do anything differently as children. We were powerless, right? I mean, that's the whole uh, the whole issue of children being abused. They're powerless. They're vulnerable. They have no way to help themselves or stop what's happening to them. You know, I couldn't get my parents to stop doing what they were doing to me. I couldn't I couldn't get my parents to stop doing what they were doing to my siblings. You know, and I couldn't get get my brother to stop doing what he was doing to me. You know, there's no way I could have stopped that or prevented that. So I guess we have to forgive ourselves, like our inner child very well may be feeling, you know, that, that we're going to let them down again as adults, right? It's like my inner child's probably saying, don't screw me over again, right? And uh, I don't know, you know, there's a whole lot behind all this, you know what I mean, uh, but as far as the emotions and the, the psyche works, you know. But, you know, I guess we have to realize that we were powerless and we there really wasn't anything that we could do. And it happened. And there's... You know, we're going to have to allow ourselves to forgive ourselves for not being able to stop whatever it was that was happening to us, you know, and to not take the guilt on, you know what I mean, by saying, oh, well, you know, like, it's my fault, I was just weak and I was, um, you know, I wasn't able to handle the, the situations. And so, you know, we're supposed to, we can truly go ahead and say it was not our fault, you know, because it's never our fault. And I mean, I, people this almost such a, a cliche to say that it was not your fault but the thing is is it wasn't you know and, and and you have to you have to truly believe that you have to understand that and know that like i mean it was not my my fault that my brother raped me you know like that was definitely i did not go and and, and tell him hey brother rape me you know what i mean um it was not my fault that my brother sodomized me i mean i i didn't even know what the hell that was you know what i mean um yeah no that's that, that was not my fault you know it was not my fault the way my mother treated me or my dad or my other siblings. This was not my fault. These people, this is what they did to me. And of course I was raging, you know. That little part of me that who through the different stages and to teen years and everything. That whole part the whole parts and pieces of me was just raging at the treatment I received from these people that were supposed to love me and take care of me and care about me, you know. So that's where the rage and the anger and stuff comes in and we have to truly learn how to get a hold of that and how to um how to channel that into something positive, you know what I mean? It has to go somewhere. That grief energy has to go somewhere. That anger energy has to go somewhere. The rage has to go somewhere. So what I've really done is work, I mean, four years ago, starting my healing journey, is working on the rage. And it helped me immensely uh, because I don't have the same rage that I did before. 
And so, you know, it's been a process. It's taken you this four year, four years and a bit. So, you know, but I would just say never give up. That's my big message. Never, ever give up. You know, just keep looking for what works for you, uh, whether it's self-help or group support or counselor, therapist, whatever it is, man. But make sure that you stick around and you allow yourself to get, have a good life and to heal. It's our right. It's our right. And it is my right to have a good life. And I choose to do it. And I'm and I'm doing it for myself. I'm doing it for myself, my little self when I was, you know, a little tiny kid, you know. And, and I'm doing it for myself when my little girl who was raped, you know, my little my little self at eight years old who was raped and, and, and sexually abused. My little self, you know, being abused the whole way through and all the way into my teens, you know, by my parents. And, you know, I'm doing this for me. I'm going to allow myself to heal and, 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 and have a good life because I do deserve it, you know. And I don't have to take their garbage and I don't have to take that on anymore, you know. So, you know, that's just it. We, we, but we, it won't happen if we give up. So never, ever, ever give up, right? Have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend. And I'll be on tonight, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio with Donna Shear, uh, president of Dreamcatchers Talk Radio. We're going to be on there tonight. And uh, that's www.blogtalkradio.com and then forward slash Dreamcatchers. But you can also just type into the Blog Talk search button at the top, Dreamcatchers, all one word, D-R-E-A-M, Dreamcatchers. C-A-T-C-H-E-R-S. I hope you will tune into our shows. We have some great hosts, and it's awesome. Um, and I'll be on my show right after that. Child abuse prevention and human rights abuse prevention is up to us. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in and spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. Have yourselves a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.